All right, hello everybody. I am here joined by uh, David W. Congdon and W. Travis McMacken. Uh, we've been talking about this interview for uh, up to a couple weeks now, and we finally had the chance to sync our calendars and get together to talk about their work and also to talk about some questions that I and others have had regarding their work. So. David and Travis, thank you very much for joining me. Uh, I've never really done this before, but uh, I'm sure it'll be a blast. Thank you. The first time is always special. <laughs> thank you. It's been Thanks. Good. All right. Okay. Uh, I think we should get started immediately. Um, I tend to like podcasts that just bypass introductions pretty much. Uh, the main idea I have for this interview is as follows. I wanted to focus on things that you have not been asked about before. I mean, I don't really want you to maybe uh, summarize your books, etc. If you want to, I mean, you can, but uh, I have a list of questions that I want to go through here. <laughs> All right. Question number one. So your friendship, brotherhood, partnership is legendary through the whole of Twitterdom. What do you love most about one another? I think our relationship predates Twitter, doesn't it, David? <laughs> <laughs> By some years, yeah. <laughs> well, actually, you know what? I, I mean, Twitter began in what, 2006 or something, something like that? I yeah, think. it predates that. <laughs> it does. It does predate that. You're right. We were. We should just tell the story. I don't think we've ever told the story in any kind of public forum. Maybe that Reddit we did, that AMA, remember that, like a decade yeah. ago now? That was probably the closest we came, but we might as well tell folks the story. So I guess we went, we met in 2001, I believe, mm -hmm. right? We, uh, we were on the same dorm floor at Wheaton College. So was that for one year or for two years? I think you were only there for the first year. Is that no, right? I was there for both. I was there for both too. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So it was two years. Two years. Yep. But we weren't that close at Wheaton. I mean, we were on the same floor. We knew all the same people. We hung out with floor kind of activities, but then we uh, had different circles of friends and you were an English major and like totally into poetry and film and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I was doing Bible and theology. Do you, you remember that class film that I starred in? I yes, I was just thinking about that. And I was thinking about the, uh, the applause that broke out when you won that award. <laughs> yeah, I, I wrote and starred in a class film about a, a, a lovesick poet. <laughs> <laughs> and I... And in many ways you still are. <laughs> Well, I wrote it for somebody else, and then they, re they read through the script, and they realized, oh, this is just you. <laughs> they asked me to play myself, um, and then I won, I won the award for <laughs> Yeah, it was fun. It was a party on 5 South that night. Yeah, that was. Yeah, that was a, that was a good time. But, yeah, no, I mean, that was, that was my crowd. I was in the, the, li the literary crowd. I wasn't in theology, biblical studies crowd at all. I didn't know nope. any about that stuff. I... I, um, in fact, I actually even, I refused to, I just avoided attending theology lectures. I, I didn't even attend McCormick's lectures at Wheaton College. Sad. Um, well, McCormick came and spoke on justification my our second year there. Is that right? And Webster was there too. Yeah. So I, the I, next I, year. So I went to hear Webster my, my last, mm. that was my last year at Wheaton College. Cher Cherry and Gooder were there one year as well. Yeah, that's right. So, so I didn't hear anybody. I, I, uh, I avoided theology entirely until my last year um, when I discovered uh, Bonhoeffer and Roger Lundin's English class on modern European literature. Mm. And, and, um, and then through English courses, read, read Bart actually a little bit and finally was, co was convinced to, to attend Webster's lectures on ecclesiology that last year. But no, I avoided the whole theology scene at Wheaton. Um, so much so, in fact, actually, that I refused to take New Testament at Wheaton College because I was afraid it was going to be too liberal. Um, I was afraid of a liberal reading of the Bible. That was going to be too egalitarian. <laughs> and um, so I took New Testament at the dispensationalist uh, Bible College in Portland um, between my freshman and sophomore years so I could have a, a solidly conservative Bible uh, course. It, this just amuses me so much to remember. It's just <laughs> endless, endlessly amusing to me. <laughs> and of course, uh, you had a cousin there. We won't, we won't out him, but uh, your cousin, who I was also acquainted with and hung out with a little bit, and more than, uh, he, more than I did, actually. I mean, you know, yeah. him, you know him better, better than I did. And uh, I remember he organized the Future Pastors of America Club, or of Wheaton Club. 
<laughs> that uh, I attended a few of their meetings and uh, he, he continued on in that vein and you and I have very much gone in a different direction. I mean, he won't mind me saying this, but we were, uh, when we were graduating from Wheaton together, you know, we were standing alphabetically. So he, he was next to me um, and we were in line together and he was asking me what I was doing. I'm, I said, I'm going off to Princeton Seminary and he was going off to Dallas Seminary. And so there was this, you know. That's about all you need to know. <laughs> that was the, two, the two paths of our family. Mm -hmm. um, my grandfather went to Dallas Seminary. I had a bunch of Dallas Seminary grads in my family. Mm -hmm. So, and you, of course, are a descendant of Jonathan Blanchard, who founded Wheaton. Right, yep. And as so, far as I'm concerned, you carry on the best in the Wheaton tradition. But I might be a little bit biased. Just a bit. <laughs> <laughs> but then we both finished in three years because we're crazy somehow. And you went and, to Princeton. Uh, yeah, I went to Princeton Seminary right away and started in there. And you took the year off and read Jungle. <laughs> I'm, still, I'm still very envious of that year. <laughs> Yeah, I took a year off, uh, waited for my now wife to finish her college uh, mm -hmm. career and um, graduate. And then, yeah, we, we married after, we, after she finished. But that, that year off, I worked at a bookstore and bought as many theology books as I could. I mean, I, I basically had this uh, discount, discounted system where I could just buy a bunch of books. I bought the entire Bart, Dog, Bart Dogmatics. <laughs> that year off. I bought everything by Jungle in English. I, I, I read through that, that year. Or almost read through all of that year, um, so it was a it was like a crash seminary course for me in that year off. Seminary where, prep. Yeah, basically, because I, I I knew at that time I was going to go to Princeton Seminary, um, but I I had absolutely zero knowledge about theology. I hadn't really read a single book um, in theology, so. Uh, and I, was, for, yeah. I forget how it happened because once you got to Princeton, like we became virtually inseparable almost immediately. And I was thinking about how that happened. I remember I helped you. I can tell you how that happened. Okay. I, but let me say what I remember. I remember. I remember helping you get into a seminar with McCormick. Right. And yeah. then I remember us working together at the library. That's true. Yeah. But I don't remember what happened like was, before that. Yeah, I have. I can find the email for you. <laughs> oh, God. Um, <laughs> I knew you were there. And I was, I was scared about going to seminary. I was scared about being in that world. I had no idea what was going on there. Um, and I emailed you asking about how to apply to Princeton Seminary. Um, I asked for your- Very advice carefully. About the application, um, and the kinds of things I needed to include, you know, or, or just to be aware of. Uh, and then I asked you for help again uh, for registering for classes. What kind, of, what kind of professors I should be aware of. Or, and also the, the kind of apartment scene, but where to, for student housing, all that stuff. I, I, I came in just totally blind. I had no idea what I was doing. Um, and it was, uh, it was a frightening experience. And I, I remember I told, I told my now wife, Amy, uh, back when we were uh, preparing for all this, um, I said, I'm really glad Travis started a year ahead of me. So I can just piggyback on everything he's done. So he's the guinea pig. <laughs> experience well i'm i'm a firstborn uh in my family and so that i'm totally used to that <laughs> so am i i mean i but i really didn't want to go into that situation uh blindfolded i, I wanted to have like a path trodden ahead of me <laughs> i i was like in your you know what would they call the tailwind you know behind the drafting the, the, yeah the draft is like <laughs> I, I was like kind of sailing behind you in the to catch your draft and um that was very much a relief for me since i was <laughs> i was really unsure about the whole situation i i was really nervous <laughs> and then we started hanging out and the rest is history yeah but yeah you're right though that first that first semester i was trying to get into, into bruce mccormick's seminar and justification um it was all full uh, it was a, you know it was upper division kind of course and i was a first semester person and I vouched for you. I told him, it's okay, yeah. he's a weedy, he can handle himself. I sent him an email too, just said, look, I really want to be in your course, you know, here, here's why, you know. <laughs> so I've been reading a lot of Jungle, and I really want to uh, just, mm -hmm. just read about him more. And um, I remember, you know, I went to the first week, I had some other genetic course that I was taking, uh, which, you know, was dreadfully boring compared to <laughs> what I to be reading. Um, <laughs> And I remember getting the email from him saying, hey, if there's a spot open, it's yours. Um, and it was like, you know, this angels, you were singing. You know, <laughs> I was ushered into the inner sanctum. Um, 
and yeah, that was that was a good moment. Uh, but yeah, we were also working at the library together, the Barnes yeah. Center, there. you know, our, photocopying articles or whatever, and <laughs> archiving things that were <laughs> whatever it was we pretended to do for them to pay us. <laughs> Although actually, that that first that first semester, we, it wasn't really Bart material. I, I remember working on. I I think at that time I was part of special special collections in general. I remember working on. Do you, do you, I think you know Carl McIntyre. Do you, you know Carl? McIntyre? Oh God, yeah. How, yeah. Many, how many linear feet of him did we have there? So, like, I mean, that, that first semester at Princeton, Princeton acquired Carl McIntyre's complete home personal library and archive. Mm -hmm. It was something like 80 boxes of material that were all just uh, in storage in the basement. And, and I, I was one of the first people who had to kind of go through and see what we had. And I was, you know, I had zero knowledge about Presbyterianism. Zero knowledge about any of the stuff. I mean, I literally came into Princeton Seminary not knowing what the difference between a Presbyterian and a Lutheran. I mean, that's that's how basic my knowledge was. I had no how, how were we ever friends? <laughs> I mean, I I had never been to a non to a, anything to a denominational church. I didn't know what denominations were really about. Um, I you know so and so Carl McIntyre stuff is just this you know it's a dumpster fire <laughs> Presbyterian fundamentalism, right? And there's the, you know, and, and he's like this media mogul at the time, and, and there's all this incredible material, of these comics that he had written of the the communist threat against America and how, you know, the, the struggle against communism was the Presbyterian fight for the faith. You know, all this stuff was in there, and it was, what are, what am I doing? What is this place? You know, uh, but yeah, it was just incredible. I remember the first year I worked there, I did basically an audit of all the special collections holdings. So there was probably nobody there for a year or two that knew what was in there better than I did. I mean, they really needed a professional person to come in there, but yeah. we were just these bumbling, you know, students trying to be, well, how do we do this, you know? Yep. It was, uh, it was fun, though. We talked a lot. Yep. Uh, I, I remember I, I drilled you on questions about, okay, what class to take here, you know? What professor should I avoid here? Um, yeah, I mean, I was... I was learning a lot more outside of class, in class, because I that first semester, not only was I talking to you during work hours about you know who should be what should I be reading and who should I be taking courses from, but I was also finishing up my my complete read through of God as a Mystery of the World by Jungle. Um, I read I read basically everything else, but I hadn't done a thorough reading of that book until that first semester. That book is tough. And it's really tough, especially for me. I had no idea what he was talking about. You know, I, I hadn't read Bart. I hadn't read Boltman. Um, and and, and you, know, you don't know the figures he's referring to. You know, it's a, so that book was my, was my introduction to seminary, really. I mean, I, I was taking these jet ed courses on preaching and communication and you know, whatever, but my, and church history. But my real education that first semester was that book. I mean, Jungle's book introduced me to everything from who – Pondenberg was to what is you know what historical Jesus stuff to uh you know who's Hegel you know I mean uh all that stuff I mean, everything in that book it was just a complete education in kind of modern philosophy and theology um and I I took diligent notes I have my, my my copy of the book which you know I still have it's all annotated on you know, all the more all the margins and I have like in the back page like a whole my own personal index you know and it's um I consulted that book repeatedly throughout the rest of my time there at Princeton because uh, everything I learned was essentially stemming from that one book. <laughs> but anyway, enough about that. So yes, <laughs> uh, I'll answer to the first question. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. So I said, what do you love most about one another? So thank you for that background, by the way. I mean, I'll, I'll go first because I, I know without a doubt. That what it is is uh, David's opinion, uh, able his ability to be opinionated on virtually anything <laughs> at the drop of a hat. Like it doesn't matter. <laughs> like it could be some random thing that you think he's never considered before, and he'll have an opinion for you, and he'll be able to back it up at length over the course of like a book length essay. Just you know, <laughs> just easily. It just comes easily for him. And that I'm always, great. A book length essay was like our, our like the phrase we used a lot. It was like this running <laughs> joke where I would say, I'm gonna write a book length essay about this topic, you know. And what do you mean was? It still is. It's, cool. <laughs> it's a it's a total Congan phrase, the book length essay. Yeah. But uh, but no, his ability to to have an opinion and for it to be well founded just 
you know, mm. at the drop of a hat on virtually anything. I've always been super impressed by that. Yeah. <laughs> Mine is easy. Um, I am insanely jealous uh, <laughs> of Travis's ability to read quickly and to consume <laughs> immense about uh, material in his reading. I, I am a slow reader. Uh, I, I will confess this. I am a very slow reader. Um, that's partly, I became a slow reader actually through my English, <laughs> English degree where we were taught, I, I had a lot of poetry reading. So I, I, I read everything. I read everything now the way I was taught to read poetry, which is like this in, in very close detail, word by word, you know, kind of study. Are you, um, are you suggesting that I don't read closely, David? <laughs> no, that's, that's the thing, though. I mean, I'm, I am very impressed with your ability to read both quickly and to comprehend it. Um, well, we're, you and I are mirror opposites in this. Like, I'm in this in this racket because I love to read, and I would be perfectly happy just doing nothing but read for the rest of my life. Uh, whereas you are very much the writer. Yeah. So I read fast and write slow, and you read slow and write fast. So Got it. that's how yeah. it works. That's fair. Yep, that's, that, that's a pretty accurate description of our relationship. Yep. <laughs> okay. Very good. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, we can move on to question two. So this is something that I was wondering about. What is something that in all of your interviews you have never been asked about, but you wish that you had been? You go, David. Uh, yeah, it's a tough one. I, um, I've been asked a lot of things, so <laughs> hard to say if there's a single thing or it really I, I haven't been asked about. I suppose I haven't been asked about um, issues what? related to ethics. I was going to say what you love about me. That's the first time that's come up. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. I mean, we've already got that question out of the way, so we've done that. Um, I mean... I have a lot of opinions about ethics, but we'll get to that later, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, you do have a lot of opinions, yeah. <laughs> Maybe we'll save that for later. But I mean, okay. I, that's not an area I'm known for, so people don't ask about that kind of material. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's mm -hmm. not, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I get asked the usual questions about Boltmann and, you know, mm -hmm. history of theology, that kind of thing. But, yeah. but I have, I mean, my, my driving interest right now, besides, you know, taking down post-liberalism and, and everything, I, are, are usually related to issues of, of ethics, um, uh, kind of ethical questions. And so um, that's, that's, my, that's an area of interest of mine that I don't get asked about, so. Um, I, I was sure you were going to say tennis. <laughs> I do, but I do get asked about that. So you know? <laughs> people know about that from, from Twitter. I mean, <laughs> if it's not theology, it's, it's tennis, right? I mean. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Uh, I, I couldn't really come up with a good answer to this question because, I mean, David does more interviews than me, but I feel like I'm constantly getting questions just from students, and I have been forever, and so I feel like I've basically been asked everything. Uh, so today, even, I had coffee with a student who I had a semester ago and who just wanted to get together to ask me uh, about theology and stuff because he's himself pretty atheistic, but he... Uh, wants to understand religion and he felt like in my class he never really got my opinion because it was kind of a global religious traditions class and I was laying out the different traditions and he he wanted to know what I thought and so I had a real um, broadly ranging philosophical conversation about dialectical theology and how it works um, and one thing that I ended up talking about uh, with him for what is probably the first time is um, Carl Sagan's uh, story about the dragon in the garage. Have you guys heard this story? I don't think so. No? So it's this, it's this little piece of analysis that Sagan has in one of his books. I think it's a chapter title. Um, where he says, imagine that I tell you I've got a dragon in my garage. And you say, okay, well, open the door. Let's see the dragon. And so I open the door and you don't see a dragon. I say, oh, it's just, just he's an invisible dragon. And you're like, okay, well, let's walk around in there and see if we bump into him. It's like, oh, no, 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 no. He's an immaterial invisible dragon. And then you're like, well, let's get the infrared gun out and see if we can sense his body heat or the heat from his fire. And it's like, oh, no, no, no. He's got this special skin that blocks the body heat. And the fire that he spurts out is just room temperature. It's a special magic kind of fire. And you just, you know, af one after another qualification, you get to the point where you have to say, well, what's the difference of there being a dragon in this garage or there not being a dragon in this garage? And so I was making the point with the student that um, with dialectical theology, that criticism totally lands because we are going to say that there is a God and uh, we think God is a certain way, but in a completely non-objectifiable, non-demonstrable kind of way, just like that dragon in the garage. And so 
uh, that was an interesting point that you had to, he paused and reflected on that for, for quite a while. So uh, yeah. that was uh, an interesting conversation I had today, a certain angle that I took for the first time that was fun for me. Taking stealing that from Anthony Flew. Who Is he really? Yeah, Flew's famous essay on the Invisible Gardener is the one who uh, mm -hmm. launched that criticism initially about the uh, the gardener who is tending this garden, who, but who's invisible and immaterial. And yeah, you know, when did Flew write that? Uh, 60s, I think, early 60s. I feel like the Sagan book's the 70s, so yeah, that could definitely have been. That depends. I mean, it, it's a yeah, it's a classic argument, but I mean, it's. Uh, and, and the responses to it, actually, there's a, a pretty good book by John Allen Knight on liberalism versus post-liberalism, um, which is basically uh, an analysis of the responses to Flew's argument um, and how Ogden and, that, and the liberal school took it one direction uh, versus the, the conservative mm. post-liberal school took it a different direction. Um, and anyway, it's a, it's a good book. I'm, this yeah. student has a very uh, philosophical frame of mind, and he kept wanting to say, like, well, how does it make a difference for truth if there's a dragon or if there's not with under these conditions? And I'm like, well, it might not make a difference for some kind of objectively ver verifiable ontological truth with a capital T, but there's this other kind of truth called existential truth. <laughs> it's about meaning and significance in life in the world. And it has a, a, makes a big difference on that front. So. Yeah. I mean, part of what Knight shows in that book is how that whole debate about the verification, you know, the verification, you know, the, the, uh, yeah, the, the ability to verify yep. the garden the ability to verify God um, presupposed a certain account of language and truth that, um, you know, was, you know, in the, in the air at the time. So mm -hmm. analyzing the philosophical presuppositions for that whole debate is, is crucial, but yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Di yeah. Dialectical theology has a completely different track in terms of their uh, philosophy of language and, and meaning. So yep. but, uh, anyway, yeah. yeah. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Moving on. Question three. Here we go. Here's where it gets interesting from this point forward. <laughs> it yeah. hasn't been interesting yet. Come on, man. No, I mean interesting in the sense of the questions that I hear the most. Uh -huh. <laughs> ask me, and I tell them what I think, but then I said, I'm going to ask them. <laughs> so here we go. Uh, what doctrine or dogma has been most difficult to shed, experientially speaking, in your ongoing spiritual and theological development i mean that's i think it's a fairly easy one for me um the the one that's i, I guess you know the, yeah the one most that's most difficult how would have to be the doctrine about um eschatological redemption mm -hmm. i think for most people um there's a sense that if there isn't a future kingdom new creation that, that rectifies all the evil in the world then um then it's a nihilistic despairing uh situation that we're in because it's there is so much evil right. uh, and you know and this is where i i am sympathetic to Moltmann and others who who make that essential point in their theology um and I, and not just him, but just the liberationists in general, right? I mean, there's a sense in which um, I think the, the, the critique of the, the Boltmannian approach that lands the most for me is this issue, which is um, how does this preach to the marginalized and the oppressed, right? Mm -hmm. um, how does this answer the one who's, um, Who's, who's living in a situation that cannot be rectified here and now, right? That is, is systemically oppressed and, and unjust in a way that no amount of present, you know, uh, support is, and political, you know, work is going to rectify the, the massive debt, right, that is incurred by the history of injustice, right? Um, and I think that's, that's a response, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a question and concern that, is uh yeah i mean that, that lands for me um and i think it's you know i don't have a way to just dismiss that because i think it's it's that's an important critique um and uh and insofar as one's doctrine of eschatological redemption it funds the kind of um hopeful mobilized action in the world i'm quite willing to let it stand and not not critique it you know, I, I, I am myself quite comfortable with demythologizing some of that stuff, 
but I understand, but, but I guess here's my, my pragmatism. I mean, if that demythologizing undercuts your, your, um, your ability to engage hopefully and, and in, in an empowering way in the world, then I'd rather you keep the myth uh, to sustain that work. It's and like that, that passage uh, from Paul where he says, everything is permitted, but not everything is useful. Right. We yeah. can demythologize everything, but we don't always need to. Yeah, and I think, I think ultimately that's what Moltmann does consciously, actually. I mean, I don't, because there, there, there are times in his writings where, you know, I mean, you can, it's unclear whether he actually believes that this is all going to take place the way he kind of talks about it. Um, and, and, he, and he has enough critical uh, material in his work to suggest that maybe, he's not a conservative on, on these eschatological things, right? I mean, there's, it's, it's almost a kind of apophatic eschatological hope, but, um, but he has it there and he, and he insists on it because of its political agency and political you know, uh, um, significance for, for how it motivates hopeful action in the world. And so in that sense, I, I think there's a lot to be said for that. Um, and, and if the position I hold is going to, to destroy that in somebody, I'm, going to, I'm, I'm concerned about that. So um, it doesn't for me. Um, and that's um, so, but I, I wouldn't, and, and partly that's also why I am persuaded by uh, an approach to theology that doesn't try to universalize everything. Not, my way is the only way you can think about something. I, I'm pretty insistent that that's not the way to approach theology. And, um, and this is one of the main reasons why. Got it. Excellent. I agree. How are you, Travis? Same thing for you? <laughs> yep, I agree. <laughs> but uh, the way you, uh, you phrase it in terms of um, my existential experience of faith, I mean, you got a sense from the, the history that David and I told you that he and I have been engaged in uh, revising yeah. our ideas about dogmas quite heavily for a very long time and uh, have, have basically... Um, rebuilt our theological positions from the ground up uh, over that time, uh, you know, ended up in some similar places, some cross-modal similarities with where we started from, for instance, an emphasis on mission and things like that. But um, yeah, I remember the very first thing that I had to let go of and try to get existentially passed as I was studying theology. I mean, I went into Wheaton firmly convinced of male headship in church and home. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had gotten past that one by the time I left Wheaton uh, and then, you know, went to Princeton and the next one on the docket was the physical or bodily resurrection. I had to get past that one, took a little while. And, and uh, then what's that? That was your first one at Princeton? Yeah. To find, to fully get past. Yeah. I mean, that didn't come for me until late in Pr Princeton, probably. I'd say I was past that one by the time I was done with the MDiv. Okay. All right. That's fair. All right. And then the big one was like just what you were describing, all the different things about um, afterlife. Yeah. Um, yeah. That one took a long time. And, and my experience with the whole process for each of these issues was I got to a place intellectually where I realized that on the, ba on the theological basis that I had become committed to, I no longer had any grounds for um, hanging on to these things. And so I, I came to that realization intellectually first that I could no longer make what I considered a compelling argument. Uh, and it then took another process and another period of time where I got comfortable with it kind of existentially. Um, so for folks who, who might be somewhere in the middle of the process where they've, um, they've hit that intellectual point, but it feels very uncomfortable, just, you know, chill out, hang on to it, uh, sit with it, and uh, you might, you know, move through that bit of discomfort, that existential discomfort after, after a while. So that's just a little bit from my personal spiritual autobiography. Yeah, I mean, if I can, I'll add, I mean, for me, like well, I mentioned before about how I took that New Testament class, that dispensational Bible college. In that class, you know, I, I got this egalitarian reading of the Bible when I was trying to avoid that at Wheaton College. And that for me, that was the, that was a major first, you know, that fell. And I, 
you know, reading, having that experience and then reading Martin Knowles, you know, Scandal of the Evangelical Mind and realizing that my, my young earth creation views were not universally held by all Christians throughout history. Um, <laughs> I mean, those, those things falling what were, were uh, it, it undercut that whole systemic approach that evangelicalism had, had kind of given me. But I remember at Princeton, the first thing that I had encountered there was the whole historical criticism, you know, the mm. Bible. Um, and, you know, documentary hypothesis, hypothesis, all that stuff about the Bible, you know, the historicity of the text. I was at that point, I was already on a basically Bardian doctrine of scripture. Yeah. So. so I came to, 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 to Princeton where, you know, having not had any of those courses, never having encountered any of the biblical criticism stuff that you would yeah. have gotten in the basic New Testament course. I had Old Testament crit, New yeah. Testament crit and all that. Yeah. Yeah. So I came in fairly, fairly fresh right out of evangelicalism, I mean, other than I was reading Jungle, which was, you know, this kind of thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but yeah, no, I mean, th I had to go through, I had to go from zero to 60 pretty quickly um, in that first semester or two. I remember, you know, I, my, my wife, Amy was, you know, she thought I was losing my salvation, that I was going to hell, you know, and I, I remember, um, I mean, there was, there was just a lot happening really quickly. My kind of my, my deconstruction kind of ex evangelical shift. Um, it moved in so rapidly over the you know, four, three or four or five months. Um, so yeah, I mean, there was a lot of stuff going on there. All right. Well, thank you for that. Uh, perfect segue for the next question uh recently on det you had a piece titled was jesus a failure seemed like it got a lot of traction going on twitter yep. and uh, i wanted to get your thoughts on that piece i mean it talks about a, a lot of it talks about a lot of the elements that you have mentioned but uh i just really wanted to get your your commentary on that since nowadays people read blog posts and they don't bother to write comments <laughs> Well, just to be clear, neither David nor I wrote that. Right. It's right. truly from an anonymous third party. <laughs> Fourth party. <laughs> um, I don't know. The whole idea, um, is Jesus a failure? I, if you haven't honestly grappled with uh, that way of seeing the world, then I don't think you have true faith. I mean, that's, it's a very... Uh, unsympathetic way of putting it, but I, I can't help feeling that way. And I, the reason I feel that way is based on experience. I remember very distinctly uh, one day walking between uh, my apartment in Princeton to the library. I was going by a, uh, I was on a back, back street uh, taking alleys and things like that. And on that back street, there's a historic building in Princeton and it's um, a couple hundred years old and it's a barracks that was used in the uh, Revolutionary War. And I was walking past the stone wall in the backyard of that house when I had one of those moments, kind of like, uh, I think it's Pannenberg described seeing the light from the train coming down, down the track. It's like I had this moment where, you know, time slowed down. I, I literally stopped walking and stood there for a few minutes. And um, I just, I was struck by the force of the idea that all of this stuff could just be made up. Mm. It could just be nothing else than, you know, shit people made up. And a phrase that I use with my students with some regularity now. Um, and I thought, well, if it's all made up, what am I going to do about it? And I, I stood there for a minute and it occurred to me, two things occurred to me. First, it occurred to me, I don't know any other way of seeing the world. I have spent so long um, seeing the world in a Christian way that I really have no other lens. Mm -hmm. And the second thought that occurred to me uh, was from Bart from his evangelical theology book on faith, uh, the chapters on faith and doubt. And the thing that occurred to me is, um, yeah, it might all be made up, but I'm free to believe. I don't have to be free from belief. I can also be free for belief. And I had that thought and I said, okay. And I kept walking and went to class. And that was the end of it. And ever since that time, I've just kind of had in the back of my head, yeah, it could all be made up. We can't demonstrate it. We can't prove it. Uh, but we're free to believe it. And it is, in fact, the way of seeing the world that has uh, captured my imagination and shapes my complete way of being in the world, or at least as I, I can bring myself into alignment with it. And um, that's good enough for me. So uh, Jesus was Jesus a failure? I mean, in what sense? I mean, still shaping the way a lot of people uh, see the world and interact with the world. 
Um, and uh, at least for the time being, some of us still think that we're free to believe in him. So I kind of just go from there. And I think that's in basic and fundamental agreement with the spirit of that, that DET post you were talking about. Okay, great. I love it. Thank you. I agree. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So, so David agrees. Good. Nothing else, David? That's good. That happens a lot. <laughs> oh, that, that's fine. One or the other of us. Fair <laughs> brain, you know, there's a... Uh... You think these things happen quite often. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, makes perfect sense. You're probably reading each other's minds or something. All We're right. having a conversation right now that you can't hear. <laughs> it's quite entertaining. <laughs> All right, so uh, it's a follow-up question here. So here it goes. Did Jesus physically rise from the dead, or was his body once dead? on the cross consumed by animals. Would you explain why bald monks would say it doesn't matter? Just for people that maybe haven't read your book. Why Go for it, that, Dave. Why does that not even matter? Uh, well, um, okay. I mean, I think the way to, I think the way that Boltman wants to approach this is to ask, um, first of all, when we're talking about the resurrection, what are we talking about? Um, and a lot of people think we're, we're just talking about, is this physical body in this grave or is it walking around somewhere? And, and Boltman, and I, think, I think I think actually Bart too, but Boltman in particular doesn't want, doesn't think that that's the right question. That's not the actual issue here. The issue is if this is indeed a special divine act, right? And not just, a resuscitation of a corpse, right? If it's a divine event, then it simply cannot be at the level of other acts of nature around the world. It cannot simply be equivalent to a doctor bringing to life again a body that might it was really, really ill, that people thought was, was dead, right? It has to be qualitatively different than every other kind of, of occurrence, right? And if it's truly qualitatively different, not simply quantitatively more, you know, more impressive, right? It's not levels of scales of magnitude here, but actually qualitatively of a different order, right? Then, um, then we're asking something different. We're not asking, is this body walking around, but rather, is this a divine act? And if it is a divine act, then it's simply not something that can be described in the way that we describe a body being walking around, right? It's something that, it's, it's an event it's accessible through God's spirit illuminating our eyes and our minds, right? And giving us the faculties by which to apprehend and understand and to receive this reality. Um, and, that, and so it exists at a wholly other level, right, of existence. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so for Boltman, Jesus did rise from the dead. Jesus lives. Jesus lives in the word preached, in the kerygma, in the, in the experience of a community uh, is called and mobilized for, for faithful action and responsibility in the world. Jesus is alive in that moment. And so it's true to say that Jesus was raised from the dead for Boltman. That's a fundamentally true claim. Mm -hmm. It's not true if we try to reduce it to the level of another natural occurrence in the world. Once you do that move, then you're no longer talking about resurrection. You're talking about something else. You're talking about some other miraculous natural occurrence that we can um, objectify and turn into um, some other wonder in, in time and space. And then we're not talking about a divine act. We're talking about something other than resurrection of Christ. Um, but if we're talking about resurrection, it has to be a, a unique divine act. And, and that means that it's, it's at a different level of existence. Okay. Excellent. So. I love it. All right. So uh, next question. This is from your book, David. Uh, as you know, I've read that book uh, a number of times. I've highlighted it. Uh, we met in Pasadena maybe a year ago in some months. Uh, I think you were. <laughs> I learned from you about my own book. <laughs> I bought your own book. So I think you tweeted that you were in town. I live in Los Angeles. And you were in Pasadena for a conference on mission. Yeah. I believe. And then I said, hey, well, I live around here. Let me know if you're free. <laughs> and then we ended up meeting. And 
uh, at the time I did not understand nearly as much. But since I have read all your books, some of them multiple times, and uh, right now the section in your The God Who Saved that really uh, resonates with me is the section where you talk about the apocalyptic trinity. Mm-hmm. And so I just want to maybe hear a little about hear a little bit about that and my question for that is the following is monotheism and trinitarianism yet another false binary that we need to push through and work beyond um enjoy (laughs) so the the section you're referring to uh which is the last chapter of the book um like schleiermacher i put trinity at the end as a kind of a capstone that kind of summarizes all my all the work previous in the book. Um, And that chapter is a, it's a mini dogmatics. um, For those of you who haven't read it, uh, it's structured similarly to something like, like a Bart's volume four in his dogmatics where each section corresponds to another section. So, um, and, and the, the approach I take in that chapter is to, I'm challenging the notion that often we, when we do Trinitarian theology, we map on to father is, you know, creation past Christ is, is uh, you know, salvation in the historical moment of, you know, one to 30, whatever, you know, and then the spirit is the present, right, in the future, right? Spirit is kind of the ongoingness of this reality. Um, and uh, I, wanted, I, I wanted to rethink that. I want to think, make the, the past really is the Jesus event. That's, that's the apocalyptic past of that moment. The spirit is the present reality of this, of this event. And the father says, the creator, as I call it, because I, I don't want to map it onto simply father language, but the creator is uh, in the future. Um, and that's similar to a Jungle or Pondenberg in that regard. But, um, but then I, I map this onto the, the event of the, of the apocalypse, you know, the, the kind of uh, presence of the apocalypse and the, kind of the ground of the apocalypse in the future. Um, anyway, that's that's what I'm doing in that chapter. I'm trying to kind of do a mini Trinitarian systematic theology in, in you know a dozen pages or so, um, and it's it's uh, in some ways it's like a sketch for future dogmatics. I suppose you could put it that way. Um, but uh, I mean, your question about monotheism or Trinitarianism, I I mean. Uh, a, a central conviction of that chapter and, and of my own theology is um, that a lot of our Trinitarian theology is deeply problematic and, and misguided. Um, I, uh, I mean, I, I suppose I want to say that um, a lot of those debates are frustrating for me because they often presuppose certain accounts of what it means to be a Trinitarian person, right? You know, the, a lot of the, the social Trinitarian stuff um, that I'm trying to work against. Um, I, I'm deeply sympathetic, and I wish I had read, before I'd written that chapter, uh, Lynn Tonstad's book um, on, on the Trinity, which I think is a, is a marvelous work of theology. Um, and her her book is is a sustained critique of social trinitarianism, but but also the the gender dynamics that get um, included in a lot of that trinitarian work. And and part of her main thesis that she concludes with is that um, talk of trinitarianism and, and trinity it just does too much work in theology nowadays. Um, we, we try to make the trinity do everything, you know. That we try to appeal to trinitarianism to solve all of our theological problems. And it's a, it's a real problem. I mean, in, in modern kind of contemporary theology, um, I, I think this is a, a real, uh, one, of the, one of the many legacies of the kind of post party and post-liberal uh, movement where um, people, people thought that Bart's revolution was to make the Trinity central again, right? That's, that's, you hear this so often in textbooks of theology that that was the innovation. Schleiermacher had rejected the Trinity and, so, and Bart brought the Trinity back, right? That, you hear this so everywhere, right? It's, it's just, it's a cliche now, but it's wrong. It's just flat out wrong. It's wrong about Schleiermacher and it's wrong about Bart. Um, and people like Lynn Tonstad and others are doing um, great work in terms of undermining that whole narrative. But, um, and, and my, my effort in this is simply to kind of uh, engage in some of that uh, deconstructive work regarding a lot of what goes under the name of Trinitarian theology nowadays. Um, I will admit, I mean, I, I do bristle a bit when I hear somebody say they're doing Trinitarian theology. I mean, I think, unfortunately, um, I mean, I'm not anti-Trinity. I have a chapter titled The Trinity in my book, but, um, 
it is um, when I hear Trinitarian now, um, it is one of those words that um, sets off red flags for me because um, I am very, I'm, I'm put on alert that this person may not know what they're talking about <laughs> and may be doing serious problems, uh, committing serious errors in their theology uh, by appealing to Trinitarianism as a solution to the woes of liberalism or whatever it is. It's usually liberalism or something where somebody's not being Trinitarian enough. Mm-hmm. That's usually what it is, right? That's always kind of the implied uh, comparative there that there's somebody who hasn't been doing enough Trinity to do more Trinity and we'll, then we'll solve our problems. And, I, I agree with you completely and it's still hilarious to me. Um, but yeah, back when I was doing my dissertation on Barth's Doctrine of Baptism, David, you probably remember there were a couple interlocutors who criticize um, Barth's theology as it ties in with baptism precisely for not being Trinitarian enough in some way. And I'm just like, well, you're presupposing what it means to be Trinitarian. This is a total nonsensical argument. And that just goes to the point where um, it does way too much work and people assume what it means instead of demonstrating it. And um, it all needs to be attacked at the foundations. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Great. Thank you. All right. Let's move on to the next question. Mm. I mean, it's kind of related to what we said earlier, but I just want to throw it out that maybe you can briefly, in one line or less, say what it is. Uh, what has been the most liberating thing you have learned and or embraced? non-competitive account of the relationship between divine and human agency or what I like to call paradoxical identity. Boom. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> I, I agree with that. I mean, I, that's certainly, um, that's <laughs> a lot of problems in theology. I will just say for me personally, the matter of, as a matter yeah. of biography, the thing for me that was most liberating uh, was when I read Paul Tillich on faith and doubt uh, mm-hmm. way, way, way back. Uh, the non, you know, the, the fact that faith doesn't compete with doubt, but that doubt is an intrinsic element of faith itself. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And this is way back when I was still kind of working in my evangelical world and trying to get, free myself from that. That was a big step out of that world. But, but notice how you said how faith does not compete I, with doubt. I almost said it's non-competitive or, you know, paradoxically identical with doubt. But <laughs> paradoxically I, identical. You know, I had a feeling you were going to say just such a thing. And uh, Travis, your answer reminded me of a series of tweets that you had, tweetable theology with the hashtag, where sure. <laughs> what you were doing, but you had that hashtag, tweetable theology, <laughs> just one tweet, and they were great. This is altogether possible, <laughs> but I have no memory of this. I'll find it and I'll retweet some of it. Okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Uh, I recently also read uh, Dynamics of Faith by Tillich. I don't know if that's the same book or something similar, maybe a friendlier version for lay people. I'm not sure. But uh, it was very helpful just uh, just to see him talk about all the dimensions of faith that people just have no idea because they just believe faith is affirming things or denying things, and they leave it at that. <laughs> so thank you. Excellent. I really love that concept mm-hmm. paradoxical identity i mean it's definitely something that i want to read more about in both your works i know that you have uh, some really good quotes on that on your baptism book travis and uh it's it's genius i love it it's also <laughs> it gets elaborated um i think in more conceptual detail in uh the essay i wrote on bard's doctrine of baptism after my uh book came out it's a uh, Definitive, defective, or deft is the the main title. It has another long section on paradoxical identity. Great, yeah. I mean, that was workshop with me. I mean, we every, were, uh, everything was workshop with you. I mean, I remember that one in particular. Though we we did a lot of work on that essay together. We were kind of like, okay, how are we? Gonna- <laughs> I distinctly remember when we were working on that essay. You saying to me, "This is your best work yet. You couldn't have written this five years ago." <laughs> 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 Thanks, David. <laughs> All right. It was true, but it was still funny. All right. This next question, I mean, maybe we'll start with Travis just because uh, I, I know he's done some work along these lines. So here you go. How about some thoughts on open theism and process theology? Travis. 
Um, I know you had a number of videos. Dialogue. Yeah, I've got an ongoing uh, series um, on Bardian theology and process theology in conversation with my Lindenwood colleague, Nicole Torbitsky. Um, so you can get a lot more of me on this subject yeah. there. But um, the problem with both open theism and uh, process theology is they're both tied to metaphysics one way or the other, which are inherently objectifying uh, modes of speech about God. So um, that's where I would want to criticize. And that said, there are um, what I like to call cross-modal similarities between what's going on in open theism and um, process theology that I, can, I think those of us in a dialectical theological mode can make common cause with them on a number of points. But uh, at least as far as my experience with it has been, there's still that, that basic objectification problem. And I would say the same thing. I would just use the language of mythology. I mean, I think the, um, the, the main problem I have with both, I mean, I, I've, I have all the metaphysical issues as well, but um, their reading of the Bible for me, the way they approach the Bible, for, as, as somebody who is, you know, I've learned from Bolt and I'm, I approach these things kind of as a New Testament theologian now. Mm -hmm. um, for me, the biggest problem is they're just uh, uncritical uh, literalism when it comes to the biblical text. If you read all the, all the texts about open, and this is especially about an open theism, but all the open theism works basically just take statements about God at the most literal level. And if it says God felt this or God changed God's mind, then they just say, look, God's mind changes. Ergo, God, you know, the open, open theism, right? You know, and it's that kind of uh, just, I mean, it's mind numbingly naive as, as an approach to the Bible. I just, you know, only, I, I would expect that from fundamentalists, you know, who are trying to, to kind of, you know, promote some sort of inerrancy approach. But I, I, I've just, I just do not understand why the open theism proponents or in the process, oh, process is a little different, but the process is very different, but yeah, definitely with the open theism and yeah. they're, they're all basically fundamentalists, right? They've just got a different fundamentalism, yeah. at, at like, least in, in their hermeneutics, at least. Right. And they're in their hermeneutics, right? So something like Tom Ward is kind of in this between, between pro open theism and process theism. Right. He's, he's been kind influenced a lot. That. But he still, in his work, is, does the same kinds of stuff with the Bible, and I, it just, uh, I, I can't, I can't understand why that is being held onto so tightly, um, because I do think once you let go of that, um, a lot of our, a lot of our other problems goes go away. You know, I mean, it's um, right now. I feel like a lot of it is a battle of exegesis. You know, who's got the most uh, verses on their side? Uh, there's a lot of proof text, right? Who has the most proof texts about God's mind um, in, in that, you know, on their side? And it's, it's like a war of you know, how many uh, proof texts we can mount on in defense of our position. I just can't get excited about that. It's just yeah, it's just there's nothing there. I mean, I, it, it's just uh, yeah, we need to do something else. The whole whole the whole system needs to be uprooted. So anyway, enough of that rant. <clears throat> okay, excellent. Thank you. I mean. I've tried. I've literally tried, but I mean, anything more than just reading a, a single blog post, it just feels like I can't do it. I literally can't. And I, I, I do will, run into people who are really excited about these things and really. Yeah. I mean, I, I will say, I, I do think open theism is good for certain evangelicals who just need a gateway drug into thinking differently about God. I mean, I. I I, I'm sure it's very helpful for somebody at a, at, at where I might have been, you know, 15, 20 years ago. If the Evangelical um, Theological Society thinks that you're too liberal, then there's not all bad there. Right, right exactly. <laughs> and I, I do like a lot of what Tom Ward is trying to do. I think, I think what he's trying to achieve is commendable. I think the method by which he's trying to achieve that is a problem. Um, and so I, I have a great sympathy for, for the project. I just, I think they are better, there are better means to achieve their own ends. Um, so, yeah. Okay, yeah, makes perfect sense. Thank you. All right, this is, uh, I think, a fun question and not that deep, so. What are some things people do or say at church and or on social media that make you roll your eyes? <laughs> All right, so I've been in churches for over three decades now. I've been on social media since there was such a thing. <laughs> Plus, I've been teaching undergrads for seven years. I kid you not, nothing surprises me at this point. Like, literally nothing. Nothing. 
And so it's not so much an eye rolling as, well, if there is an eye rolling, it's just a here we go again. Yeah. And it's, it's getting to the point where I, I saw a, um, a meme or something years ago that said, uh, you don't have to attend every argument you're invited to. And so that's, that's become like, I could, I should have that like tattooed on my body. That's like a maxim at this point. It's like, yeah, I don't have to have that argument with that person right now. Not my responsibility, not my monkeys, not my circus. So I, I agree. I, I do have an answer to this question though, because I, I, I do think there is something that bothers me. And I'm saying this now, somebody who's been, who's, an, who's a confirmed Episcopalian. I, I belong to the Episcopal church. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so I'm I'm speaking now about, more progressive mainline church context, right? I mean, I could talk all day about the evangelical churches I've been a part of and what I'm, what I roll my eyes at about that stuff. That, that's that's easy. Yeah. For me, though, this was a recent experience um, at the church that we're at now, where um, I I do get very tired and very frustrated with the, with the progressive mainline liberal pastors and and you know and priests who who still feel in the need to attack atheism in their, from the pulpit. Mm. You know, is it, is if, the, because I think, I understand the reason here. I mean, they're anxious about loss of membership. They're anxious about, you know, whatever it might be, but there's still this kind of ingrained knee jerk uh, need to, to, uh, to oppose, um, the you know the the new atheists or the whatever it is whatever it is the the other out there outside of the church and as often atheism is usually what it is you know it, it's not it's no longer you know other religions or anything like that it's usually the atheist is like the ultimate other still and that's that's still there in so many of the mainline churches that um and i i, I that that is grating on for me and i find that very frustrating and uh I like to see that end. But, I can uh, see that. I haven't had that experience um, in the uh, you know PCOSA churches I've been in, which is my mainline experience. But it's also the case that I've had students complain on their course evaluations that you shouldn't <laughs> let an atheist teach religion classes because they <laughs> they get the idea that I'm an atheist one way or the other. So uh, <laughs> I have a slightly different perspective on these things. I guess. Right. <laughs> oh. Okay. Great. Yeah. That reminded me, I don't know why. Sometimes I just get these thoughts that come into my mind. Immediately I thought of one time you guys were interacting. It was a holiday. It was some kind of holiday. Who knows what holiday? It fell on a Monday, I believe. And David was uh, tweeting about some news about evangelicalism. <laughs> and then Travis replied, do you ever take a break? <laughs> <laughs> And then David replied with this meme with, uh, I think, Sesame Street, and it's a fire. <laughs> the one I really like that's so appropriate for David, it's a, a man and wife in bed together, and the man has his laptop screen open. And the woman's like, honey, come to bed. And he's like, I can't. There's somebody wrong on the internet. <laughs> that's my mental picture of David whenever... <laughs> Yeah, that's no, yeah. but uh, I love that. I thought that was so funny. I mean, David really takes things very seriously, and you know, uh, I'm thankful, <laughs> I'm thankful that you're doing the the hard work, even right now with the anti right uh, lectures. <laughs> I don't know what to call talk it. about. Talk about things that make me roll my eyes. <laughs> Hearing about those lectures, that definitely <laughs> does it. So yeah. I don't um, know how you've had the stamina, David, to put up with that. Uh, well, it's, it's, it hasn't been good for our, my marriage. I'll put it that way. I, I think, uh, I remember yesterday, you know, she, Amy was just like, Daddy, you need to stop watching NT Wright. <laughs> it's it's got to stop. It's not good for your own health. Um, oh, I know I liked Amy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, wow. I mean, you're the Twitter threat king as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> All right. So. Next question. So a while back, probably about a year ago or so, I read this book titled Theology of Hopelessness. And so basically they're kind of- no, 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 no. You can't skip number nine. I have a really good answer. <laughs> Let's go back to nine. Here we go. All right. What's been the biggest theological disappointment 
disappointment you've experienced or witnessed in your lives? The election of Donald Trump to the U.S. presidency. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean I'm very disappointed, that. but I mean, it was kind of predictable as well, but yes. Oh, yeah, totally predictable, but a huge theological disappointment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, biggest, I don't know, biggest theological disappointment I've experienced. Um, I mean, okay, I mean, I, okay, so I think for me, again, going back to the biography, in terms of what had the personal effect on me, um, uh, I, I suppose it was, um, okay, so when I was, uh, that year, I was like between, I think I might have still been a Wheaton at the time, but I remember taking a summer off, um, be, well, I'm not summer off. I mean, I was in my summertime off, you know, between second and third year of Wheaton, I think it was. Um, there was a campaign going on in Oregon at the time uh, about, you know, the defense of marriage stuff and, you know, and in terms of, you know, defining marriage as a man and a woman kind of thing. And I just remember, I mean, at the time, I was still fairly conservative, but 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 Amy and I were driving through the towns, to the streets of Portland, and we saw all of the signs, you know, arguing for yes, we should change the definition of marriage to this, and they were all in front of these churches, right? All the churches were the ones that had these signs plastered all over their their walls and all over their lawns, um, the cars with the Jesus fish were next to this bumper sticker with that with that uh, ballot measure on it and i i remember at one point amy turned to me and just said um what what what, what do lgbt people people in this city think about christians driving through these streets you know like what what is their what's the, what's the message they're getting from these bumper stickers and from these uh you know signs in their yards and i think that for me was like a a, a really kind of turning point for me in terms of how I, how I understood uh, message, how we presented ourselves and how we, how we approached uh, Christian witness and public, public witness in the world. Um, and then uh, shortly after that was the Iraq war uh, around the same time. And, uh, and then of course, all the evangelical um, support for the, in, the invasion of Iraq and uh, all that, all that stuff. So, I mean, I think that kind of that crucible of all those, political issues in 2003 period, 2004, um, was just the kind of, uh, that for me was a disappointment that, that broke that for me, that, that whole way of thinking. Mm. So. Got it. Great. Question thing. Here we go. So in America, both theologically and politically speaking, things often look pretty hopeless. Gladly contradicting Molman, some have argued for a theology of hopelessness. These folks believe that rather than inspiring and enabling believers to disrupt the status quo, a theology of hope ultimately paralyzes us as, as the challenges we face are seemingly insurmountable. A theology of hopelessness, on the other hand, relieves the pressure of trying to change the world and enables us to attempt the little things in our communities. Thus, long term, a theology of hopelessness is better suited to bring about hope in our world. What say you? I'll, I'll let David give the sophisticated answer. But um, <laughs> for me, <laughs> I, what, I'm, I want to talk about what's kind of become an important meme for me. And um, it comes out of Lord of the Rings. There's this passage in, in the Lord of the Rings and the Fellowship of the Ring. Um, that Tolkien writes shortly after Gandalf is, oh, spoiler alert. It's shortly, <laughs> it's shortly after Gandalf has fallen in the, uh, in the mines of Moria and the fellowship is on the other side and they're the emotion is catching up with them and they're finally dealing with it. And I have this passage, um, on, literally it's, a, I made it into a poster and put it on my wall. Um, and it's Aragorn speaking and he says, we must do without hope at least we may yet be avenged. Let us gird ourselves and weep no more. Come, we have a long road and much to do. So we must do without hope, but we've got a long road and much to do. And I think that balance um, 
is really important. And I remember, I mean, I've read this a million times in my life. It's so, so those are some of my favorite books, but um, especially after more recent uh, political events where I was really wrestling with, okay, what's the next step? Um, and, and just in terms of the political language um, that got deployed over the past decade or so, you go from a president who emphasizes hope to a president who says, no, we're not moving forward, we're moving backwards. Um, I said, what, what do we do in a world without hope? And then this, this is the passage that came, came to mind. I mean, you've still got a job to do. Uh, you have to do without hope for a while, but we may yet be avenged. And so, you know, get ready to work. Okay. Great. Right. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I assume, you'll be, are you referring to uh, Della Torre's uh, book on hopelessness? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, so, I'm very sympathetic with that position and with that overall approach. And I think that's not too much of a surprise given uh, what I've written about Boltmann and the journey into the dark. I mean, I think, um, so one of the lines that I use pretty, pretty heavily in my work um, comes from, uh, well, it's one that Boltmann uses heavily in his own work for that matter, but uh, Boltmann uh, quotes a phrase or, or adapts a phrase from Martin Luther regarding faith as a, a journey into the darkness or a, a, into utter darkness. Um, and, uh, and Boltmann uses that a number of times to kind of, kind of capture uh, an image, what he, how he understands faith. Uh, faith being not this, not this quest for certainty and absolute uh, you know, uh, sureness and, uh, and foundations that are going to be stable and, and confident, right? but rather um, a, a displacement of ourselves, one that requires us to, uh, to abandon our quest to secure ourselves and, uh, and place our trust in God. Um, and, and so faith is, is, is this willing surrender of our, of our need for certain, uh, for certain outcomes. Um, and and uh, and a sureness, all right, and um, and I found that to be uh, deeply meaningful for my own my own faith journey, but uh, but I also find it to be um, I, I, mean, I find it to be a faithful representation of what I take the gospel to be about, what what I think it's what I think what I think the New Testament is really trying to say, um, speak about, but um, and uh, yeah, I mean. I, I understand what somebody like Moltmann is up to and what I think he's achieving there. Um, I have, I'm sure in his context, a theology of hope was a word that needed to be heard. Um, I mean, no question. I mean, there was a certain kind of despair about picking up the pieces of a post-war culture in Germany that was, I mean, and he's writing in the context of a divided Germany too. And so, I mean, a theology of hope, I mean, a hopelessness in that context was, was, was prevalent. It was all pervasive, right? Um, Travis and I are working within this context of neoliberal optimism about the possibility of technology and the future, you know, singul you know singularity and all the rest. Like this, this, it, this capitalistic uh, um, euphoria about the possibility of, of, of technology and progress in, in, in this kind of 21st century America where um, – uh, the ability to to refashion ourselves and create the utopian society of uh, um, that the libertarians want, right, is just is pervasive, right, and um, and and there's a there's a lot of um, confidence in our ability to to fix things, fix the world, and. Um, and so I, you see a lot of pushback about this, you know, whether it's something like, um, you know, hunters work on to, to, to change the world and try to kind of a more, uh, you know, restrained approach to this stuff. But I do think kind of a, a theology of hopelessness is needed and um, certainly a timely word within our context in which um, a lot of the grand visions are ones that are, are, uh, in, are, it, are, in, are tied up with capital and tied up with, with systems of power and oppression that are problematic. Okay, great, excellent. Thank you for sharing. All right, 11, if you had to, what other religion would you embrace and why? 
I've been waiting for this one. I like this question because uh, I get to teach a bunch of different religions. Mm -hmm. um, and I can honestly say that there, I've over the years found something in each tradition that I've taught that um, is meaningful to me and that I find attractive. And I, I'm not going to bore you with the list of things, but um, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, Confucian, yeah, I mean, all of them, uh, one way or the other, are attractive to me. I think personally, um, I'm most drawn toward the Chinese traditions. There's a lot of um, a lot of my personality that's just a natural fit with Confucianism, and I think this is the same bits of my personality that thinks it would be great to live in Calvin's Geneva. <laughs> that's kind of just something that I have in me this this uh, drive to self discipline and regulation. Um, but when it comes down to it, I think if I had to be another tradition, I'd want to be Chan Buddhist. Uh, it's a Chinese Buddhist tradition. And I, it's interesting, Bart um, heard snippets, let's say, about Japanese Buddhism, or Pure Land Buddhism, mm -hmm. which is all uh, focused on uh, one's faith in Amitabha, Amida Buddha. Um, and if you basically say a certain phrase and put your faith, your Shinjin and Amitabha Buddha, uh, you get to go to his Pure Land when you die. And so the obvious parallels to Protestantism here, Bart, Bart points this out. Uh, but I think Chan is a lot closer to dialectical theology because unlike most of the main traditions in um, Buddhism that want you to seek enlightenment, uh, for Chan, Chan is Zen, Chan is just the Chinese word, um, you don't attain enlightenment. It's not a process whereby you train yourself through meditative practices to achieve it. Uh, it's not something you accomplish. It's something that happens to you. And all you're doing through all your practices of meditation is trying to get out of the way all the things about your life that clutter you and prevent enlightenment from coming to you. But at the end of the day, it has to happen to you. It's not something that you can achieve. And so the, the parallels with kind of the event focus in dialectical theology are very clear there. And even down to the point where um, part of the meditative practice is just to break down your normal conceptual way of interacting with the world uh, and breaking down those concepts and basically blowing your mind so that you can perceive in a new way at a new level. And there's lots of parallels to Schleiermacher here in the dialectical tradition where the encounter with God is pre-conceptual. Uh, so that's, that's the one that actually I think um, stimulates me the most intellectually so I would, yeah i would agree with that i mean i think it's definitely uh, some some version of buddhism i there's a uh, 1983 book by uh, uh yoshinori called the heart of buddhism um and he actually makes a connection between uh boltman's account of the kerygma and 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 pure land buddhism um mm -hmm. and arguing that in pure land buddhism with the amida buddha uh there's a uh, a present here and now encounter with the Buddha, the name of the Buddha, that uh, is there's an advent of that name, uh, kind of in the same way that eschatology um, intervenes and comes into the presence uh, of, of here and now in our history through the kerygma. Um, so I think that's a fascinating connection there. And, and there's, uh, but I think other Buddhist traditions, certainly the one, you know, like, like what Travis was just talking about, would relate to dialectical theology very well, maybe even better than pure land for sure. Um, so I'm, I'm inclined that direction as well. Great, excellent. I knew you have good answers because I mean, you're both theologians and Travis, I mean, you teach religion, so. <laughs> Great. All right, so this question will make you reflect a little bit about your lives. If you could, if you could go back to the summer of your high school graduation, what would you attempt to become career-wise if you could do it all over again? This is easy. I would go into poli sci. Political science. Wow. Yep. Uh, you know, I thought about this a lot since my career didn't work out the way I thought it was going to. Um, you know, I think the the romantic side of me says I uh, I, w I would have wanted to go and and study film and and <laughs> become like a, a screenwriter or a writer. I, I love film. I love I love writing. I would have wanted to go into you know work in Hollywood and try to develop, uh, you know, scripts and stuff for TV yeah. and film. Mm -hmm. um, that's like a personal dream of mine. But, um, but realistically, uh, I would go into law. law. Yeah. Um, I think I would make a pretty good lawyer. And uh, I, 
it's it's fun for me now in my job. I'm I'm currently an editor for for legal history and law books, uh, as well as political science. So I'm I'm editing the kinds of books that I would actually be very interested in writing if I were in a different career, if I had chosen a different path. Um, but I find a lot of what goes on in legal studies and legal history very similar to theology. You're dealing with a text, the Constitution, often, um, and how you interpret it. And there's debates between originalism or inerrancy uh, versus, you know, uh, other other forms that are more hermeneutically critical. Um, and uh, and, you're, and you're engaged with, you know, similar kinds of real life issues of justice and, and human rights and the rest that are um, they're also similar kind of concerns. So I, I find the legal field uh, fascinating and I, you know, you might, who knows? <laughs> you'd be unstoppable in a courtroom. You just keep arguing until the judge was finally like, enough, you win. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I do love that environment. <laughs> I, I, would, I would enjoy watching uh, the other side, you know, cry. <laughs> That would be fun to watch. I mean, you would make law fun. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe grading papers would be more fun if I actually got the. Never mind. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't, <laughs> that's that's something actually I I, I don't miss about the, the way my career has turned out is uh, I don't have to suffer through things like Travis suffers through these meetings that are interminable and, uh, and I suffer. Let me tell you, I suffer. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. I mean. Who knows? I mean, maybe where I'm at is actually the best place to be. My wife this evening, uh, when we were filming this, I went home and it was a long day. It was a Monday and it was a Monday. And, and then she's like, oh, and you have to go back to your office for that interview tonight. And I'm like, at least that's for me. That's going to be fun. It's the rest of it. That not. <laughs> yeah, Mondays are rough. They definitely are. Yep. Thankfully, this Monday is pretty much over, at least work-wise. <laughs> All right, so next question. So if we had to put warning labels on the front cover of your books, what would they say? I refuse to answer this question. I want your answer, Juan. What would, what would the warning labels be? All right. How about you, David? Do you refuse as well? <laughs> I, I, I want to hear your answer too, yeah. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> well, I think that we have to have a warning. <laughs> So it would say warning, colon, semicolon, two periods, I don't even know, colon, right? And I think they would say, uh, do not proceed unless you're ready to have your assumptions blown up, or <laughs> something along those lines. And I say that from experience because I mean, that's literally what happened to me as I began to read your books. I tend to be a really open-minded person. And so, I mean, I'll read just about anything if it's interesting. And, uh, I mean, I thought I had a lot of things figured out. <laughs> Needless to say, after reading your books, I mean, wow. I just had to, I just had to question my assumptions, which I never realized were driving everything. But once you get to that deep level of questioning your assumptions, I mean, that just brings about so many changes, so many insights, and uh, that really helps you make sense of so much, I think. So that would be my label that I would put, warning. Do not proceed unless you're ready to have your assumptions questioned, destroyed, demolished, or something along those lines. I like it. That's Danger, awesome. I can Danger. here be dragons. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So uh, we hinted at this earlier. Uh, this is something that I've been thinking about. Uh, does dialectical theology have anything unique or singular to say about ethics? Again, I'll let uh, David give the sophisticated answer. I like to do that. Let him give those answers. Um, but for me, the ethics of dialectical theology is in the best of the humanist tradition that I find in most of the different religious traditions, uh, it's usually some version of the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. In Confucianism, we call it the silver rule because it's stated negatively, don't do to others what you'd prefer for them not to do to you. Um, also in Confucianism, you get things like, uh, if you want to be established, if you want to be prosperous, make sure that everybody around you is established and prosperous. Um, 
ties in, I mean, Kant puts this in philosophical terms with the whole idea that you don't make human beings a means to an end. Um, so I think all of that is definitely um, part of what dialectical, eth theological ethics would be all about, but also the idea that in dialectical theology, um, we have to do with the God who um, cares about and promotes uh, love, life, and liberation. And so anything we're going to say about dialectical theological ethics has to, has to be normed by the idea of love, life, and liberation. So those are the broad strokes that I would want to pursue, and I'll let David be sophisticated about it. I mean, the, my interest in this question, there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot going on here, but I think, um, you know, so much of the debates in ethics are, I mean, ethics is kind of a weird own realm, right? I mean, people who do, who do ethics are kind of their own species of, of, of intellectual, and they, they're, sort, they're, they're usually lumped in with philosophy. Um, there's theological ethics, but that is a really, there's a muddy mess over there. And so, you know, um, what, I, what I find fascinating about these debates about ethics is, is, you know, they're always debating about, you know, is it, uh, you know, the ontological, is it natural law, is it virtue, whatever, you know, all, all these things. I'm, I'm, I, I find myself puzzling why the options are what they are often, you know, like, why are they, why are we limited to the, to the presuppositions and philosophical frameworks that are often being uh, promoted? And, and, and um, what I think dialectical theology does, uh, if, you, if you take its theological um, presuppositions and, and its starting points and you work them out ethically, um, it, it does uh, upend a lot of our ethical uh, inquiry and, and uh, assumptions. And I think, um, where that becomes important for me, uh, I mean, it comes down to allowing ourselves to um, not not have ethical absolutes that are universally applicable in every situation. Right? I think that's, and this is what Bart was up to. I think in his ethics, in, in many ways, um, but all people have, people have been trying to kind of corral Bart into kind of a natural law approach or into a virtue approach. There's all these efforts trying to like contain Bart's ethics and make it. Uh, amenable to the kind of ethical theories that we have on offer right now. And uh, I, I am here to allow Bart and allow dialectical theology more generally, and Boltmann for that matter, to be as radical as I think they are trying to be when it comes to ethics. Um, and, I, you know, I have been, I, a lot of people like to hate on situation, situation ethics with Fletcher. Fletcher himself was kind of a problematic person and situation ethics is, is a, is a crudely simplistic book. So I, I get the hate that is kind of heaped upon it, but I think dialectical theology kind of redeems the situation ethics and provides it a different uh, foundation for it. And I think that's necessary. I think we need that. And um, uh, I think that has a lot of application, especially to issues of gender and sexuality, the issues of politics as well. Um, it, uh, anyway, I'll, I'll leave it at that, but I think there's a lot uh, to explore with ethics and, and dialectical theology. It just needs to be free to do so. Um, right now, there's just so much restraint on that field. And I, I wish people would read more Lehman, uh, Paul Lehman, oh, yeah. especially his book, Ethics in a Christian Context, where he um, yeah. makes a lot out of the concept of maturity which you know, always sticks in my mind because of the um, connection to self-transcendence and self-development that you get in the Chinese traditions. Um, but this idea that um, what God wants in every situation is for us to be mature people. And right. uh, maturity for laymen has something to do with um, responsibility to that God of life, love, love and liberation. So uh, people need to read more, more laymen. And there's lots of these uh, books in English language theology from the 60s and 70s that people still haven't dealt with because when they came out, they didn't understand them at all. And so the conversation just moved on and uh, we need to stop and pay some close attention to those works and the different opportunities that they were offering to us, but that we missed at the time. Yeah. There was a spirit of freedom in a lot of those works that is missing from today. Yeah, and everything just got locked down into the whole post-liberalism mode and that uh, removed the possibility, like the practical possibility of alternatives. And we need to wind back that clock a bit. Okay, excellent. Great, thank you very much. All right, so next question is also about DT. 
What do you say to those who are pretty much convinced and won over the dialectical theology, but are hesitant to embrace it, fearing that it will wreck their spirituality or set of spiritual practices without oh. giving them something else to work with? I'm, I'm really actually quite exercised by this question. Um, I mean, and you can see it in the difference between David and I, just in terms of religiosity and overall outlook on life. I mean, David, with his Episcopalianism, and I'm about as non-liturgical a Presbyterian as you're going to find. Um, I don't know. I don't, have a, I don't have a religious bone in my body. And I really think that a lot of my intellectual and spiritual struggles when I was younger and going through Wheaton is I was trying to find that evangelical religiosity in me somewhere. And I finally gave up and decided it's not there. I'm not a religious person. And I've, for a long time, I've just joked, I don't have an inner life. Uh -huh. I just don't. Um, it's, it's just not part of my personality. And so one of the great things I think about dialectical theology is that because of the idea of non-competitiveness uh, between divine and human action, because of paradoxical identity, um, you don't have to first be religious in some sense, uh, to be a religious person, uh, and then be a Christian or then be uh, theological or what have you. You don't have to take that step. You can, you can step right out of the material everyday concerns that confronts everybody in our world and start thinking about those things and precisely those things with a theological lens and this other level of, of existential reality um, without making that intermediate step of, oh, you have to become religious. You have to develop certain spiritual practices. You have to have a certain kind of piety. So that's something that I really, really, really appreciate about dialectical theology because that stuff is just not in me. It's just not how I'm made. At the same time, I think it's really important to recognize that this is a personality thing. And I think I've just come to think that a lot of the differences in Christianity and different kinds of Christianity that you find are really come down to personality and that you have to give people the freedom to be who they are, spiritually, religiously, what have you, um, and find the, the expressions of that that's going to work for them. And this might change over time uh, based on context and age and, and beliefs and these sorts of things, but that's really up to them. And I have no business telling them that they shouldn't have an inner life, they shouldn't have a spirituality because that's not in me. And at the same time, they have no business telling me the opposite. So. Um, that's part of what I like about dialectical theology is it makes room for all of those different options as, and even more radical ones on either side, uh, new ways of being church that people like to talk about. Um, all of that's a possibility based on, uh, how you go about for yourself creating value. And so that's something that I actually really deeply appreciate about dialectical theology. Yeah, I, I agree with all that for sure. I mean, I think um, my own approach to like say liturgy and spirituality is I, I am more aesthetically driven, you know, so for me, I connect, uh, I, I have an encounter with, with the divine through, through, act, through moments of beauty and through moments of, of aesthetic beauty. Um, I mean, I, that's, you know, my work in, in my English language, poetry, you know, background, that's, that's a big part of my own development. I mean, my, my, my going to art museums is, is a sort of religious practice. Uh, that's, that's a big uh, part of my own like, life that I value. Um, and so that, that's what, in some ways, liturgy does for me is that moment of beauty, that encounter with, with the beautiful. That being said, the other thing about liturgy for me that is, um, connects up with what Travis was just saying is part of the reason why I like the kind of uh, strict liturgy of the Book of Common Prayer over against um, you know, looser forms of worship is, um, is that the, the repetition of the same words and over time, um, the, the experience it has is that it makes those words invisible. And that, and that invisibility, that transparency of the liturgy allows for this almost <laughs> uh, spiritual that is in some sense like ultra protestant actually this is the irony of, of of these uh of these high church liturgies is that after a while the the words become transparent to this encounter um that is uh beyond language 
beyond uh, reflection, it's pre-reflective. Um, and so in that sense, it, it actually has allowed me to connect with that kind of what I call the unconscious moment of faith. Um, I, I encounter that unconsciously through this repetition of language. I mean, this is like what Taze does right, in, in, in their songs. They try to have this repetition of words that gets monotonous after a while, but that monotony serves to make the words you know, transparent to this moment of, of encounter. And um, so in that sense, um, I, I too, uh, I'm not so wedded to, to religion at all, really, or liturgy. It's, it's simply one potential vehicle for facilitating that moment of encounter um, where we're taken out of ourselves and, and forced to, to confront and see ourselves in a new way. Um, and that can happen in many other places. I mean, I think people uh, find that at other locations. I'm actually very interested in the Oasis communities, the kind of humanist uh, uh, churches, so to speak. There are, are, are in many major cities around the country, and there's one here in Kansas City that I, um, I get their updates about, and I like to go visit them, except they are on Sunday mornings. Um, if, they were met, if they met on Sunday night or Saturday night, perfect, but, but they, they're trying to compete with churches, and so it's a, it's a bad time for me. But, um, but I really like those kinds of uh, more humanist church gatherings. I think there's something there that is worth uh, exploring, and I would find that often pro probably as meaningful um, as a standard physical service. And I, I think there's a great deal of value in having a religious community just because it's important to have a community. I mean, in this day and age, you have your immediate family and then you have your friends that you've picked and are, you know, as close as family like me and David or something. I mean, that's hardly um, having to learn to live with somebody who's fundamentally different from you in some key ways. So I think the discipline of community is very important and that churches provide that. And I think the discipline of the liturgy is very important. Like my church is not non-liturgical. Um, the discipline of the liturgy is very important for how it shapes our imaginations. And so I, and I fully, I'm a sacramental, I do sacramental theology. I, I fully appreciate all of these things, but it doesn't hit me at the religious level right. in the same kind of experiential way that it hits somebody like David and it might hit others. Uh, that said, however, um, probably the most meaningful aspect of uh, my Christian practice is the Lord's prayer every Sunday just because you're joining with this community of people in this prayer that a community, this community of people has been saying for 2000 years. And there's actually some pretty good stuff packed in there uh, that can, you know, blow open your perspective on the world in some key ways. So um, that's, that's probably the piece of the liturgy that comes the closest for me to being some kind of a religious experience. But, but like I said, I'm just not really wired in that aesthetic way um, that David is. So I interact with it all differently. Yeah. And I'll just add to it. For me, I, I mentioned this on the Reconstruct podcast when they interviewed me, but uh, for me, the moment of liturgy that, that is the most charismatic for my own life is, uh, is the confession of prayer, uh, the confession of sin and the absolution. Um, I think that moment of confession and absolution is in some ways for me, uh, the charisma in a nutshell. Um, that is that encounter of, uh, that's kind of moving out of ourselves and in the, in the hearing the word of, 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 of grace and forgiveness. Um, but I do think, but I will say this one more thing. Um, I often get a question about studying Boltmann, and that, and that is, what has that done to your spiritual life? You know, what has that done to you? you know, like, can you remain a Christian or can you remain spiritual? Can you, whatever, because having studied this critical hermeneutical uh, work. And um, I do find that kind of question frustrating. And um, I think it's um, the assumption being that the worth of a theology is determined by how it uh, makes you more religious, right? Um, and and that, that equation that is like, do you pray as much or do you pray more? And if you do, then somehow you are, your, your theology is more uh, verifiable or, or uh, more truthful. Um, that, that assumption, which I get a lot when I talk to people about Boltmann is, um, I think that needs to be interrogated. Okay, I'm glad you covered that. While we're talking about prayer, this is a book by Ronald Gregor Smith, Secular Christianity. It has an appendix on prayer, and everybody should read it. That is all. Thank you for putting it in front of the camera so that we can read it. Excellent. All right, so uh, last question. So as we conclude this interview, what is something you'd like to share 
with our audience, uh, perhaps an upcoming project or anything of that sort. Yeah, David, are there any projects haunting your dreams? <laughs> so many. <laughs> but, you know, haunting like a specter might. Yeah, yes, yeah. Um... I mean, I, I, I need to finish uh, a volume on Barton Boltman. That's like having a uh, collection of their, of their writings back and forth to each other. It, I'm finishing that up. <clears throat> um, but I am also working on kind of a, my response to post-liberalism. And can't wait for that. My reassessment of the history of 20th century theology. Uh, as, as my students will, would say, it's going to be lit. <laughs> It's, it, it doesn't pull any punches. <laughs> yeah. yeah, excellent. All right, well, that's pretty much it for me. I think I covered all the questions. I mean, I'm, I'm working on a book too. Go for it, Travis. Uh, I'm working on a book with uh, Ashley Coxworth. Um, maybe you know the Classics of Western Spirituality uh, series, and we're doing one on BART. So that should be a lot of fun. And as a condition for my joining the project, I said we have to do a section on Bart's political spirituality. So you can look forward especially to that. Wow, excellent. Nice. Any idea when that will be published, perhaps? Uh, 20, 2020? 2020. 2020? Something like that I think we're aiming for. Cool. At the moment, we've, uh, we've gotten a good bit of work done collecting um, the bits that we want to put in there from Bart. And we're in the process of securing um, the publication rights to those, and then we'll start stitching them together and writing introductions and things like that. Excellent. So, David, uh, this year you're not going to have anything published, right? But maybe next year, correct? That's probably, yeah, that's safe to say. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Hopefully. I was, I was looking forward to reading some other book from you this year, but I will just wait till next year. It's been a, it's been a rough last 12 years. <laughs> yeah. just, just read the tome again. Surely you've forgotten some part of it. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> that, that one I hope will have will have a new life a new life on it. Uh, it's been it's now out of print, mm. uh, but I uh, hope to see it yeah. come out in a new form soon. So it's exciting. Excellent. Great. Well, guys, thank you very much once again for just letting me interview you. I don't have a podcast or anything, but uh, I just appreciate this uh, opportunity to interact with you online and now through video, which we've never had before. So. <laughs> well, I, I don't want to speak too much for David, but I know that I've appreciated your enthusiasm about the stuff we've been writing and thinking through. So it's great to uh, lay eyes on you, as the old saying goes, and, and have a good chat. Yeah. Anyone who's read my books as many times as you have, uh, it deserves my thanks and appreciation. So yes. <laughs> Juan might have read them more than me at this point. <laughs> that's, <I> mean, I have. <laughs> well, that's not saying a lot. You just write them and they're done. <laughs> well, you know, let me explain something. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I never went to Bible college. I never went to seminary. So whenever I want a book, and if it's especially a good book, I don't care if it's $90. I don't care if it's $100. The way I look at it is I never paid thousands of dollars for a theological education or miseducation, depending on where you go. So, I mean, I just remember. When I read your books, I mean, obviously I know how much I pay for them, but at the end of it, when I'm done reading the book, for example, uh, The God Who Saves or the big tome on Bart and Moltmann, I mean, I find this so helpful. I ask myself, if I could go back and I knew that the book was actually $300 or $400, would I buy it? And if I can say yes, then I say, wow, this was a good book right here. This was a book book. And of course, I'll reread it again. And so honestly, that's the feeling that I get when I'm done with your books. I ask that, myself. That's some really now, high praise. <laughs> now that I have that kind of money, and I have bought, I have bought expensive books before, but uh, I, say, I say to myself, would I read this if it was $200, $300? Was it that helpful and stimulating? And honestly, the answer to me with both of your works, the answer is yes been that helpful and uh yeah i just want to thank you for what you have done this is where if we were on twitter i'd send you one of those gifts that has lots of hearts or something in it right exactly 
uh, I think you need to do a, an interview on, on how you do this. I don't even know how you do it. How, how to do the gifts. <laughs> <laughs> Not an interview, man, a master's <laughs> class. But that's, that's a topic for another day.